This is Sunny Boy from the Street Saint Loyal Show on YouTube. And I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Let's jump right into it. I want to touch on a few things that we didn't really get to get to in our last interview and just a couple things that have happened since you and I last talked. But I want to get the elephant, you know, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, obviously, since the last time. Are you calling me fat, homie? Are you calling me (laughs) fat? Hey, since the last time you were on the show, you, you left American Cholo. Um, in my opinion, yes. you guys were a great dynamic. Uh, so it was quite a shocker to me and I'm sure to a lot of American Cholo viewers. Um, I'd love to know your side of the story and, you know, why you decided to leave. Well, first and foremost, I want everybody to know I still watch the show. I still support them. Um, it's been coming for a while. Um, I had actually spoke to him maybe a year prior to that. And told him that I, I thought that maybe he should be doing the podcast by himself, that he didn't need me, and I would be in the background just helping. But he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I want you there. Um, and then, like, I, like, I don't want to bad mouth, bad mouth him. I don't want anybody to think I am bad mouthing him. Um, we have a difference in opinion. Um, and I just thought it was time for me to walk away. I had been competent. Comp- I've been thinking about it for a while, and um, I I didn't have any intentions of starting my own channel because I had nothing to do with, no bearing on it. It was just, uh, I wasn't comfortable with the format that we were doing. Uh, I wasn't comfortable with not having any kind of say-so anymore. I wasn't, um, it got past the point of uh, me just helping him out. Was there one thing that just was like, this is it? Like, you don't have to get too specific, but you were like, all right, this is it. I'm, I'm done. Um, it's one thing when I feel a certain way. It's another when a band feels a certain way. But when other people start getting involved that are not a fan, let's just say family, start getting involved, uh, it takes us to a whole different level. I, 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 I actually try to work it out. And, um, either he didn't hear me, he didn't want to acknowledge it, but he came to a point where I was like, okay, I'm done. And his response was, okay, I'll give you more airtime. But it wasn't about airtime. It was never about airtime. It was about um, common courtesy. Uh, you know, you, you guys see it play out inside the show. And it got to the point where I just wasn't going to have it anymore. And, um, you know, I, I like I said, I, I support John, his guilt channel. Um, he doesn't feel the same way. Um, he doesn't want me to succeed. And and that's cool. I'm not, you know, what I mean, I don't know why he's upset so much, but uh, I just did my best, you know, what I mean, to to defuse any kind of situation that might happen or arise, and I needed to address it when I did, and that's what happened. I just say hey, that's it. I'm done. And no talking anymore. When I say when I said that word, I was just, I was done. I was like, you know, what I mean, there was no more no more conversation about it. And what I liked about your dynamic also, which kind of made this a little bit harder to swallow, you know, when you did bounce was I like the fact that for lack of better phrases, you, you were both from different bodies who used to, you know, war back in the day. And, you know, you guys came together for, for peace, you know, with this podcast and, you know, just unfortunately it just didn't, uh, it didn't pan out. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Like I said, I, I, I still watch the show. Mm-hmm. I still care about, you know, so it's kind of hard to walk away from 30,000 subscribers, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, I like to think, I know he doesn't think it, but I like to think I was part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was hard to, hard to walk away. It was like, okay, 
I'm gonna walk away from everything that we built, and it was it was something that we built together. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just him, and it wasn't just Bobby. It was something we built together. Um, but uh, you know, and, and there was other things, other factors that um, made it even harder to walk away. You know, but like I said, it's uh, I, I wish him nothing, him and Bobby, the best. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it uh, if it makes you feel better, and we'll, we'll jump away from this topic, but I want to end it with this. If it makes you feel any better, I kind of went through the same situation when I was started my YouTube journey a few years back. I jumped on, you know, with somebody and helped uh, this person build. <laughs> I'll keep it real, build uh, their following to where they got up to a significant amount of YouTube followers. But it wasn't mine, you know what I'm saying, and and. I feel now better looking in the rearview mirror, hindsight being 2020. I'm glad I started my YouTube channel because I have 25,000 subscribers. It took me, shit, almost two years to get 20, 25,000, but I guarantee you, and I've already seen your growth, I guarantee you will be right back to those 30,000 subscribers by the end of this year, dog. You are, this probably was the best thing that ever happened to you. I know that sounds crazy, but all the all the funds are going to go to you. I mean, you have full control, and there's no doubt that you're going to get to thirty thousand. You're already at like one point eight, and you have only been open for like a month, dog. <laughs> it, it, took you know, me, uh, it took me a year to get to a thousand subscribers, homie. Well, I had you guys helping me. I had all you guys helping me. Listen, um, you guys all all stepped up to the plate and promoted my channel and. I had a lot of support from you guys, you know, and that's something a lot of people don't get. You know, and that was, um, I think that was the biggest uh, step because as soon as like, you guys got on board, it was like, wow, I got a lot of support from you guys. Yeah, um, good. And you know what? It, it, it's not about the money. Um, if I never get monetized, I'm not tipping. It's, uh, it's about uh, the message. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Chain Loyal Show on YouTube. And I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. I want to know a little bit more about Sunny Boy. Let the audience out there know a little bit more about you, people who don't know about your channel uh, and things like that. But I guess the first thing I want to know is, how did you get the name Sunny Boy? Um, it's kind of funny. My my that my father's name was Sunny. That's what his nickname was, Sunny Boy. The same thing. Okay. But not gang affiliated. They said I'm the. They said I'm the sending image of him. Ah. And I, I do look at him, but you know he doesn't look the same to me. You know he looks different. <laughs> but just the thing, um, as I was growing up. I kind of picked up on the name and tried to use it. I was using it, but um, later on, the homeboys started saying that Sunny Boy from the Cocoa Puff commercial, the bird. Oh, I didn't even know that was the um, name. Because Sunny Boy, the bird, was um, really calm. He didn't trip about nothing. But then as soon as something snapped on, which was the Cocoa, Cocoa Puff, Puff. <laughs> he went cuckoo for So that's why they named me Sunny Boy Damn. from the bird. That makes a lot of sense. That's homie. why that name stuck. Well, speaking of, of hood names, gang names, things like that, I'm always curious. I've never asked this question with all the OGs, veteranos, uh, gang members that I've had the you know, opportunity to interview. But I'm just curious, you know, when it come, when someone passes down a name, like let's say there's a little sunny boy or a baby sunny boy, um, you know, how does, how does that work? How does, you know, an older guy go about, you know, seeing a dude in the hood and be like, okay, I'm going I'm I'm to I'm give my name to that guy, even though you guys aren't related or anything. Um, a lot of the time, they're not even giving it to certain people. Not like um, they they don't have no option on who that gets that name. Mm. There are certain names that are not allowed for whatever reason are not allowed to be reused. Mm. Um, and I think uh, well, if they're not allowed to use their their there's going to be a specific criteria for that person to get that name. Like, um, 
me, for instance, my nickname, nobody else has it. Mm-hmm. And I've asked why. I've asked the homeboys, why didn't you get my name? Because I don't think anybody deserves it. Um, there's other homies that, uh, hey, there's three three or four different Morenos, you know what I mean? Mm. From the neighborhood, and they weren't passed down. And a lot of times, the older guys will be like, hey, I don't want my name out there because um, they're not about it like I was. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They get mad because their name got passed down. And, and, and it, it, it's kind of weird when people don't really understand. Yeah, we're all one neighborhood. Mm-hmm. We're all for one gang. But, so, uh, um, sorry about that. One thing is, um, when the generation passes, it's a different neighborhood. So when, when you guys, you got, yeah, we're all from the same neighborhood. We all claim the same thing. We all do the same thing. But when it gets to a certain point, it's not your neighborhood no more. It's their neighborhood. They choose the name. They choose to do what they want. Uh, okay. We ain't got no say so. Hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of Does sense. That it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Have, have there ever been instances? I'm sure there have been, you know, where, you know, someone was put on the hood or whatever, and they give them a name that's similar to someone else's name or, or the same name. Does the does the older guy like let's say let's say someone uses Sunny Boy, and he's a mm-hmm. you know eighteen nineteen year old cat right now from from your from your hood, but you like you said you have you really have no say so you know because you're not out there banging and doing making decisions and things, but right. um, and you know this guy's not about it, about it you know he's not someone who you were even a 10% of what you were, you know, 25, 30 years ago, um, would you be able to say anything? Like, no, nah, I don't want that dude having my name, or is it just like, shut up, old man, type shit? No, I could probably step up and say something and um, fight him for the name. Like fight, um, fight? Legit fight? Fight, fight. Oh, wow, no shit, huh? Yeah, I could squabble for the name, but in my mind... Or in any old gangster's mind, anybody, they were harder than they really actually were. Mm. Um, you know, in my mind, mm. I want every fight. I gotcha. terrorize everybody. But so I can't say that he's ten percent because I'm not out there doing what he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. Gotcha. Now, because of bad name, and then it comes to me, and somebody says, "Hey, you're a rat." Then yeah, I got I got all the right to go. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Day Loyal Show on YouTube, and I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace, a steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Well, I would love your, your opinion on this. This was kind of a big story you know, uh, in social media, th- two or three, about three, more like three months ago, but it still kind of has legs and there's still people talking about it. But are you familiar with this dude, uh, Black Cat, from Lakewood, California, by the name of Block Boy? Does that ring Block a bell? Boy. Block Boy, Block no. Boy. All right, well, let me tell you the story. Maybe it'll ring a, ring a bell to you because I would love your opinion on this, but... He, here, he, he was a dude, and I'm going to explain to my audience as well who don't know, even though I've talked about it a few times. He was a, a dude who went around from hood to hood, from neighborhood to neighborhood, and he would actually film himself disrespecting neighborhoods. He would go literally drive to Hoover's, drop, hop out of his car for like 15, 20 seconds, F Hoover, F Hoover, blah, 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 spit on their, you know, their, their graffiti or whatever the case is, and, and hop into his car. He'd go to Nickerson Gardens. He'd go to Long Beach Crips Hood. Like, he would literally, that was his thing. And he amassed, like, a huge following on Instagram by basically tiptoeing with death and almost committing suicide. And I followed the guy um, about a month before his passing, um, Sonny Boy. And the way he passed was he was found shot dead in his car in Lakewood. Um, had a lot of enemies, and a lot of people wanted his head 
you know, now after hearing the story, and I would love for you to check it out after we even have this conversation, you know, you'll go down that rabbit hole doing it for Instagram likes. What are your, what are yeah, your thoughts I know on what that? You're, I know what you're talking about. I okay. Yeah, that kid, I don't think he really thought, my personal opinion, I don't really think he thought that they want to get him. I mean, it was that serious. Uh. But that is a serious thing. You're getting in people's neighborhood and now. Uh, disrespecting their, their snuggles out there that will look for you. And obviously they found them. Um, you can't go disrespecting a barrio or a hood or um, get homies and expect that, that nobody will retaliate because there will be somebody that retaliates. There will be people out there that are taking periods. <clears throat> now him doing a clout, I don't really think he thought anybody was going to get him. But, um, They'll track you down. <laughs> they they track that poor kid down. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, he uh, he had to pay the price. You know, you want to play the game, you're gonna pay the price. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And the only people that suffer at the end are his family. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm sure he had a mom, whatever, dad, family. You know, he had a kid, I believe, or a kid on the way, or something crazy. Well, all those views are not gonna do him any good now. Exact, Mundo, homie. Exactly. That's what people don't see the bigger picture. What's going to happen tomorrow because of what I'm doing today? Yeah, and not only that, it can it can hurt your family as well. You mentioned, um, you know, disrespecting uh, dead ones. They do that in song a lot um, now. That's a big thing in the hip hop community. You know, with these younger cats, is they diss the dead ops. They're dissing, you know, the opposition, um, the homies that just died. They're making literally full songs about them. Um, and, and I was talking to an OG, and I would love to know if you know anything about this because you spent some time in prison as well. But um, I was talking to an OG maybe in his 40s, he was about 45, 47, something like that. And he said, you know, that's not a new thing. Because all this time I'm thinking, oh, this is a new thing, dog. They're dissing, you know, the dead homies. They're rapping over, rapping about it. And he's like, nah, man, they were doing that. And they were doing that in, in prison. They would, like, beat on the table, boom, boom, ksh, boom, 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 and just, like, make a whole song about, you know, their enemies and, and their dead homies and things like that. Um, did you ever hear hear about that, or is this new to you? Um, I think that's more of a black, okay, uh, a black. Uh, uh, I want to say a uh, thing because Rasta is is doing it more now than they have ever before. Um, I hear people speak their they 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 spit their rap and then they will sit there and throw a slug at somebody about. Um, their homeboy is passing, and then and then the youngsters running around kicking down candles and yeah, yeah. Oh. disrespecting <laughs> the, the the memorial sites. But it's um, I think for a long time that was more of a black thing, and Rasa was more uh, more cautious about that. Where back in the day, you weren't allowed to write on certain murals. Um, you didn't, you know, not because of uh, their dead homies, but just because you didn't disrespect murals. Nowadays, there's a I, lack of respect all the way across the board. I remember seeing that as a kid. Murals were clean as hell. There'd be graffiti everywhere, but the murals were clean. Now, nope, graffiti everywhere, all over the mural, all over, you know, um, the, the the virgin's face and all that. You're like, wow, dude. Yeah, there was this one mural right here in East Los Angeles. They did a theme of the Warriors. As well, man, bad. Damn, Whoever did it, just you know, artistic work, and it lasted for about a good month and a half, and everybody started crossing out the faces, and, um, because they didn't get along with the, the artist, and it wasn't no memorial; it was just a basic mural, yeah. and it lasted for about a month, and they started defacing it and ruined, um, ruined the, the artistic work of it. To me, it was more uh, uh, a community picture than than about gangs. It was just a community, you know, community pride. And, um, yeah, these kids don't have any respect for it anymore, um, but they start crossing them out and disrespecting it and uh, defacing them. And I think that's something that's new that's happening because it didn't happen before. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Saint Loyal Show on YouTube, and I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it. 
just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. I remember the early 90s specifically and just how crazy it was it was a war zone even if you weren't a gang member i was a civilian but i it was crazy i mean you, you know uh, in 93 i believe we had upwards of 2400 homicides um it seems like we're kind of going back in that direction with crime being uh you know on the rise everywhere you know la homicides are on the rise it was like 25 murders in the first 24 days of the year some shit like it, it's going crazy out there um but my memory serves me correctly you were locked up in the early 90s right serving that long bid yes okay so you yes, you weren't exactly. out on the street when, when did you get uh, locked up again what year 1992 oh shit so that was about as crazy as it was on the streets um, yeah, it got pretty bad. that was about as crazy as it was in 92 um but t- talk to me about you know life sunny boy's life specifically in the street and just how crazy it was just before you got popped for you know that that big bid just before i got popped i was actually trying to get in the service because i knew where i was heading oh wow okay. um they wouldn't accept me in there um i i i could feel it i i didn't want to go to prison i was like I could change. I can do something. Let me just get some kind of a structure in my life, which I thought would be the service. Uh, the Iraq war jumped off and the Persian Gulf, and I wanted to go. I wanted to be at the front line and try to uh, change my life. You know what I mean? I, I would much rather take a chance over there than the chances I was taking over here in L.A. Because there was a point um, just before I got busted, that you just didn't have to worry about other neighborhoods. You had to worry about the cops. You had to worry about other neighborhoods. You had to worry about your own neighborhood and just random people coming up and shooting you because it was uh, anywhere from from eighty five to eighty or ninety. I got shot twice and I had been stabbed multiple times. So it was um, it was popping no matter where you were at. It was just always. You got caught. You got caught. Guys were just dumping on everybody. So, uh, yeah, it was kind of wild. Um, but you could see it coming. It wasn't like, uh, it wasn't all of a sudden. It was it was progressing slowly but surely. It was just getting more violent, more violent, more violent. I remember about hearing about two neighborhoods that were chopping each other's heads off and dropping the bodies off in, the, in their neighborhoods. So, yeah, I... It got pretty bad. <clears throat> Damn. And I know you, you know, as a person, like I said, in my generation, we, we tend to care more about politics, more about what happens in our neighborhood that we own a home in. Uh, you know, what's what's happened in our country and things like that. Um, I, I normally don't dabble on, in politics on my show, but just knowing you, I, I would love your, your opinion on this. Uh, just going back to the 90s, um, you know, 91, 92, 93, L.A., the country had the highest crime rate it ever had. And come 1994, uh, Joe Biden, who is our current president, he ended up passing a 1994 crime bill that, you know, in hindsight, you know, quote unquote, I'm putting in quotes, put a lot of blacks and Latinos behind bars. When I was younger, I want to share my opinion with with you and then I would love your your opinion. And please, if it's different than mine, I I still want you to share it with me. I know you would. (laughs) <laughs> you ain't no b- <laughs> um, but you know when I was younger I was all like that's some bullshit man F that he put a bunch of our people in jail this is some BS as a 43 year old man who, who cares about my neighborhood uh, I understand it more I was 12 you know what I'm saying in 1994 whatever age I was I can't remember 14, 60 whatever however it was my math is off right now but my point is I was an early teenager so I didn't really understand it and it was like oh that's some bullshit as a 43 year old man I understand it a little bit more and keep in mind I'm not really a Biden supporter but I do understand that drastic things were happening in the street and that to get that to stop drastic measures had to be done um what are your thoughts on the whole 1994 crime bill looking back i think uh they did what they had to do at the time um 
for a lot of people don't know, who realize this, I got homies that were going for murder, murder, attempts, shootings after shootings, and they kept getting out. And over stupid stuff, or they would give them just a little bit of time, and they'd be right back out. But it was a kid that didn't really do too much, actually did one little thing, and they get busted and get a gang of time. So it was like almost like a, like they didn't want to stop it. I think the crime bill forced them to stop it because where we – It wasn't about the race. It was about stopping what was happening. And it was our races that were doing it. It was the blacks and the browns that were out there killing everybody. It wasn't, um, I don't think it was based on race. I think it was based on the fact that this group, this this gang, um, and it was mainly, um, mainly uh, uh, aimed towards the gang. And it just happened to be that. Mexican and black gangs were the ones that were perpetrating these crimes. So I, I think it was a good thing that he did what he did. We needed it. We needed, uh, uh, they needed to stop it for a little bit so that it doesn't get as wild. Right now, they're getting more lenient on the crimes. And, and I don't believe that they should be giving out the time they give. I think there's different ways of um, dealing with things. I'm not sure how, but I was saying that Prison hasn't changed anybody's, um, hasn't deterred anybody from committing crimes. All they just keep going in and out. All these years that we've had prisons and nobody, it, it hasn't changed anything. If not, it's made it worse. Once you get in a prison, it's like, what else can they do to me? And, and, but I think they needed to do some kind of kind of like that to lock everybody up. We needed it. We had too many people out here just killing everybody. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Saint Loyal Show on YouTube. And I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about prison since that was a big you know chunk of your life that you spent. Uh, you had a few videos that I've been checking out, and once again, I encourage everybody out there to subscribe to Leonard Acosta YouTube channel and follow him on Instagram as well under the same name, Leonard Acosta. Definitely, definitely some good material there and some great content, guys, and it's only going to get better because I know this dude has a gang of stories, but let's talk a little bit about prison. Uh, you did a video titled Checking Paperwork, which yes. I, I found very interesting, but I didn't want to watch the whole thing because I, I would like for you to, you know, to kind of give us a synopsis of that video. When a, when a, a Mexican gang member is sent to prison, uh, explain to us the whole checking of the paperwork process and more sadly, what happens if someone's paperwork doesn't check out? Now it's more prevalent. Paperwork nowadays is more um, checked than it was back in my day. There was people that had uh, less than, how would you say, less than uh, good charges. <laughs> That's the best way yeah. I could put it. Messing they would have up. charges yeah. they shouldn't have. And um, they usually were discovered uh, by people's sallies or, or when they went to do their uh, classifications. Uh, it's usually when it came up because uh, the 128 G would tell you if you had an R in your jacket, which was a sex crime, mm. then you would have to explain it. Nowadays, from what I understand, you walk in with your paperwork and that's your driver's license that you have to show automatically what you're cracked for. So I think that's why the, the violence has is, is gotten higher in prison because now if you have something from 10 or 20 years ago, it could pop up now and, and you get got um, when I spoke about that, the paperwork on, uh, on my show, it was basically aiming at uh, these kids that get on our channel, on the YouTube channel, and start talking about, uh, oh, this guy's no good. This guy did this. The guy did, did that. Um, 
I'm not going to be on my channel checking paperwork on the, on the subscribers. I'm not condoning anything that they do. I'm not saying that, but I'm not going to sit there and be checking everybody's paperwork. We're not on the joint. Um, the, the, these guys is, that have these messed up charges on them, um, they get got in the, they got got in the system right away now because of the fact that they do check the paperwork. So, um, paperwork is more prevalent than it was back when I was a busted. You also made a video titled, What You Think You Know About Prison. Uh, talk to people out there, you know, explain what you mean, you know, meant about that. And what are some common misconceptions about prison? You know, things that you may see in a movie and you'll be like, that is not how it goes, dog. Hollywood, you know, BS and, and, and things like that. Um, you, you. When you go to prison, I know in prison movies, they're all you get with your race and you're protected. Um, that's only to a certain extent because you still have to do what you have to do. You can't. There's no walking away from it. Um, you still have to man up. You still have to be a man. You can't sit there and just, oh, because I'm from the South Side, I can do whatever I want and get away with it. It doesn't work that way. Um, and then to top it off, you get people that don't like you. And it, it, it's real common in prison. There's a lot of homies that don't like you for whatever reason, don't like what you did on the streets, don't like what you did in the barrio, or just don't like your barrio or your area at all. Um, so there's a lot of hate, a lot of uh, mistrust in there. Um, people will try to get at your girl. They'll get your phone, they'll get your address somehow, and they'll start writing your girl. They don't care. No there, There's really no respect. It's uh. Everything's more based on fear. You're not gonna, you're not gonna um, go tra You're not gonna go get at somebody's girl if you have respect for them. You're not gonna go out of your way and, um, get somebody's address. And I don't know how they do it. It could have been my Sally. It could have been whoever passes the mail. Whoever, uh, whoever sorts the mail in the mail room. It could be many different ways that somebody gets your girl's address. But they've got my wife's address a couple times. Wow. From my ex, um, and, and got at her. Um, hmm. People think everything is uh, it, it, it. They think like, okay, I'm getting out. Like, like for instance, there was a homeless that got busted. He did five years, and I talked about it. He got five years. He did his time. He was on his way home the same day, and the cop thought it was funny to pop a northerner cell. So as he's supposed to get, he's walking up the door to go to R and R to get released. Uh, the Northerner rush him. Wow. And he sat down because he was like, "I'm going home." Well, he's probably in trouble when he comes back, if he ever comes back. Mm -hmm. um, there's no excuses. The rules are the rules, and you have to follow them. They're black and white. There's no gray in between. There's no getting away without well, having an excuse. Um, I lost visits where my family was at the visiting room walking out there and something happens in front of you and you got to do what you got to do. You ain't got no choice. Your visit, your visitors could have drove 12 hours to come and visit you for a couple hours and you land up getting them or something because you were there. You have to do it. You ain't got no choice. So these guys think, oh, well, I got my date on this date and I'll, I'll do my program and I'll do this. I'll, I'll stay out of trouble. I'm just going to do me. It doesn't work that way. When you're there, you're there. And it can happen anywhere. It doesn't matter where it's at. It doesn't matter if you're getting out. It doesn't matter if your mother's dying. It doesn't matter if your kid's dying. When something jumps, you've got to do what you got to do. There's no excuses. These guys think it's all structured. It's going to be this certain way. No, it's not. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, pitfalls in prison that you got to watch it for. When you're in prison, it's those rules, those set rules that they have that you're going to follow. And if you don't, you're going to deal with the consequences. And we all know what those consequences are. Mm. You're going to get stabbed. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get hurt one way or another. You're not just going to walk away from something. Mm. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Day Loyal Show on YouTube. And I'm here with Dusty Vision TV, the homie kicking it.
Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food. You made a video titled Some of the Homies I Met in Jail and Prison and Their Impact on Me. Talk to me about that. <clears throat> there's, there's been quite a few people that made an impact on me in prison. There's a couple of them that these guys were as hard as you can get or you can imagine. There was, uh, they left that impression on you. They're, these guys are killers. They're not, uh, they're not normal. You, you know who they are. <clears throat> but the three ones I talked about was this guy Nava, this one kid that was 16 years old. And uh, who was the third one? So I want to talk about the 16-year-old. He had actually came out of state, sold a car, came to California, wanted to see the beach. Had a little fun. Him and his partner decided to uh, go back. So they came up with this little plan was, I got a knife, um, and I'll, I'll track somebody's keys when one of the females come into the restroom. And um, she started screaming, and he stabbed her, thinking he was just going to shut her up. She died. And he and when I was talking to him, he was telling me that uh, that he had seen a lot of movies. Because, mind you, he was 16 years old. Mind you, he's seen a lot of movies. And all the movies, he goes, I see people get stabbed all the time, and they never die. They say he died the first shot. And all I was trying to do was shut her up. He got life without. Mm. He wasn't a bad kid. He was a good kid. He, he was just like a little brother and everything. Like, uh, he didn't do anything bad, trying not to get involved in nothing. But mm -hmm. he he got no choice now. He got life without. And Nava is a guy that I was um, in architectural drawing with in uh, one of the the, uh, um, the prison programs that they had there. And he used to be writing those 602 complaint forms all, every day. And I used to mess with him because I had heard rumors about him killing multiple people in prison. That uh, You know, there was a lot of rumors about him not to mess with him. But I used to mess with him because I'm, I'm like the type of guy. I like start poking the bear and just see what he does. Um, and one day I was clowning him about his 602s and he told, I call him a dumbass. Playing around, not serious. And he told me, you're the dumbass. He goes, don't you got life? And you're sitting here and just, you just took it. Mm. it. Took me a couple of days. To, oh, shit. It just got, it, hit, it took like five seconds for me to catch what he just said. But go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. It took me Damn, a couple of days. That's a deep statement, homie. So I asked him, uh, can he help me? I ain't going to help you. I'll show you what to do. And he got me involved in the law library and started yeah. my process to, to overturn my case. Wow. And just before he left, just before I left, he had told me, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And he was dead serious. He wasn't playing. Wow. Latino dude, black um, dude? No, he was Mexican. Wow. And he was, he, see, the funny thing about this guy was, he was, I believe he was from Yale. Graduated at the top of his class, and he was a big wig what? CEO. They got busted. Mm. This dude was not a criminal. This dude was uh, went to Yale. He, mm. he lived his right, right life right with his brother. He went with his brother to go drink some beers, and it led up him picking up a murder because they killed his brother. <sighs> and he was there. So it was this day. I offered him, I think it was 90 days. And he told him, I'm not going to give you 90 days. He had already been there 90 days. And he told him, I'm not going to give you 90 days. I'm not going to give you the conviction. I spent my whole life on my career. I'm not just going to give it up like that. And he let him get in. I think it was 15 to life. But when I had seen him, he had been down longer than 15 years. Mm. You, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know out there, um, he you got a life sentence overturned. Um, remind me again how many years you spent? Before you eight years. eight years. Okay, so you were in jail for eight years, um, but you were supposed to spend life in in prison, right? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> talk to me about because I've heard people who I, I literally interview people who are in, 
prison right now, you know, who call me from their cell phones. And um, they say that, you know, it really didn't hit them right away. It didn't hit them. You know, some say it hit them when the judge told them, you know, life. But some are like, man, it didn't really hit me until such and such happened three months into my life sentence or, you know, whatever the case is. When did it hit you? Fuck, I'm going to be in jail for life. It hit me in 1997. Okay. Five years after I got convicted. Huh. Three and some change after I got convicted. I was, I had gotten up, me and my Sally, we had gotten up to go to breakfast. I woke up in a bad mood. I could tell that I just wasn't feeling it that day. Went to Chow, and on the way to Chow, I tell my Sally, hey, Itrushan, what it means be careful. Mm -hmm. I go, something's happening today. Something's, um, something's wrong. And he was like, I don't feel nothing. Because you always feel tension in there. But he goes, I don't feel nothing, dog. I go, what? So just be on your toes, homie. So we're going to eat. I didn't really eat. We came out, chow, and walking back around the track. And I looked up at the gunner. And then I looked up at the walls. And then I looked at the fence, uh, the barbed wire over the wall. And then... My Sally had said something to me, and I was like in a daze, just looking around. And he said it again. I told him, I'm never going home. And he goes, what? Well, Dick, I'm never going home. He goes, Dave, you had life for how long now already? What the hell? Because very few people knew I had life. I didn't yeah. tell everybody. I just, like, whatever. Um, I didn't feel like anybody needed to know anything. It's none of their business what I was going to. So I was like, I'm never going home. And it hit me that they gave me life. I'm not, I'm not going to ever see the streets again. This is not temporary. This is my home. And it took me, it took me like a good couple of years mm. that, um, that it, it finally snapped in my head that I wasn't going to, that I was never going to get out. I was never going to see my, uh, Spend a night with uh, another woman or any, anything like that. Nothing was ever going to be the same after that day. And that was, um, like I said, in 1997. Mm. Damn, what a trip. Five years in, huh? God. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, that's, I've heard that once again from a couple people. Just didn't hit them right away. Just it, something, and it was something simple. You sat down, like you said, and you just looked around, and you're like, damn, I'm fucking here forever. Um, yeah, it didn't, it, you know why? When I first got my life turned, I knew the game. I was like, oh, oh my God. And, and, and to be truthful, I cried. When I hit the cell by myself, I cried. Mm -hmm. But then I was, as soon as the time to walk, open those doors, I was like, all right, whatever's clever. Pump myself up. Whatever. Let's do this. I don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. But in 97, when, when it really, really hit me, I was like, oh, my God. Ain't never getting out of here. <laughs> mm, damn. This is Sunny Boy from the Street Saint Loyal Show on YouTube. And I'm here with Dusty Vision TV. The homie kicking it. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. A steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Were there any um, white or black dudes, uh, you know, that you got close to in prison? You know, that just for whatever reason, they grew up around Latinos. They, you know, whatever the case is. You know, that they just, they hung out with you guys. And, you know, the other part of the question is, do they, you know, how how, how are they treated differently from, you know, to the best of your knowledge from being in a predominantly Latino gang? When a South Sider rolls in and he's black, um, and he's a writer, everybody knows him. You'll know about him before he even hits the system. You heard about him in different counties. The county you hear about him in the, in the prison in the prison system. You'll know about him before somebody would have told you about this guy. You know who they are. There's no hiding it. There's no when a black Torreño or a black officer walks on the yard, everybody knows who he is. Every race, everybody does. If he's a writer, 
there's no disputing it. He's ready to roll. You can see it in him. You can see, and everybody knows about him. Right now. now, I personally never got in, um, close with any blacks or white um, Southsiders. There's much more white Southsiders than there are blacks. Um, the white Southsiders, you know, they grew up with the homies. A lot of them grew up with the homies and know how to program and you would never even think they're white because the way they act. Um, I actually knew a, a couple of white um, Southsiders that were, you would never know they were white just the way they acted. Mm-hmm. And But they're not, um, the homies will eat with them. The homies will program with them, do things with them. Me, if you would have put a black Southsider in my style, I would have to tell them, hey, homie, I'll do respect, but you got to leave. Um, I'm not going to eat with them. I'm not going to sell up with them. Um, there are some homies that will. And that seems to be, uh, uh, there's homies that don't. There's homies that won't program with them at all. They won't disrespect them, but at the same time, they're not going to program them. Mm. So no matter what they do, there's some blacks that, that people just don't won't gravitate to, but that won't happen with the white. Mm. Yeah, interesting. What is the difference between a South Sider and a Sodeño? The South Sider is from the South. And when you Southern say South, California you mean... Gangs. Okay, Southern California gangs, okay. Yeah. A Sodeño is involved in more structural things. Does that make sense? Yes, it 100% does. Yeah, they're more involved in more structural things than than uh, a South Sider. South Sider is um, just people that grew up in the uh, Southern California gang mm-hmm. area. They're South Siders. Who are some of the gang and or prison type YouTube channels that Sunny Boy messes with out there? <sighs> I like Gunner Collect. He is a northerner. He's a Norteño. Um, but he, he's spitting the truth. He's not lying. He's not glamorizing. He's not all. Uh, he's giving the real game. But at the same time, he's not giving the game where it's going to cost somebody um, something in prison. He's not snitching on nobody. Not dry snitching. Mm-hmm. As far as I've seen so far. So I, 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 like, his, I like his content. I like watching him. Like listening to him. Um, there's there's a Samoan that does it too. Um, Thirty to Life, that's his name. Oh, yeah, Thirty yeah. to Life, and mm-hmm. yeah, he does some good content. I like his stuff. Uh, that's pretty much actually it as far as gang platform. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other people that, that touch on it, but. I really don't, um, and I've pretty much seen a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I just don't really uh, agree with what a lot of people glorify the gang, and and that's not something I agree with. So I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna sit there and, and um, like there's one show, twenty three and not twenty three and one. Um, it's some Boston kid. I can't forget his name. End of sentence. I like watching his, his show, but I don't believe half the stuff that comes out of his mouth. Mm. Just on the basis that he thinks he got a three-year term and he's probably been involved in 600 incidences in the system so far. Mm. You know, like every day, they make it seem like every day is a, a war and every day something's popping. And it's not like that in prison. There's a lot of dead time and nothing's happening. Gotcha. Tell us what we can expect from your channel. Um, but before that, what is your number one mission with your channel? My number one mission is to reach out to some of these kids mm-hmm. before they take that turn that I took. Yes. That's my number one mission is to reach some of these kids. People talk about, oh, why don't you give them a class on school and prison? 
is because I want to stop them before they get to prison. Mm. I want them to understand that. Mm. They're not going to get nothing out of prison. They're going to be kicking with my enemies the same way they killed. That's, mm. the, that's the way it is, you know. That's a reality, you know. You're going to mind somebody, you're going to listen to somebody, you're going to do what you're on somebody else's program when you're busted. And um, that's my thing is just keeping these kids out. Then know there's a different option. You can walk away with your head held high and not have to go through that. Thank you. Still have your respect. Yeah, thank you for that, dog. Real talk. More more people like you are needed, and you would reach more people doing it on YouTube as you're doing now than you would if you were teaching a class or doing a class in prison. So, you know, you could talk to some cats in Boston, you know, Philadelphia, you know, who are who are going to watch your channel. And you're going to save lives if you haven't already. And I think we discussed that in the past. Um, one more time, Leonard Acosta on YouTube. I encourage everybody out there to check him out. And also, um, it's it's Instagram Leonard Acosta as well, right? Yes. Cool, cool. Yeah, Sonny Boy, man, it's always a pleasure, dog. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace.